Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Mateen, I'm one of the co-founders of Heap and I'm thrilled to be here today. I wanted to thank Product School for having us and I'm very proud to be joining all the other speakers in this lineup. So the title of my talk today is, What is an Insight and How Do You Get More of Them? Now the genesis of this idea came from a number of internal talks we've had at Heap. For those of you who don't know about Heap, we're a product analytics company that has pioneered what we think is a unique and immensely powerful approach to analytics one based on auto capturing behavioral data and then blending that data with the scientific process to make sure that you can build an amazing product. I'll talk more about this later, but as an introduction, I'll say that if you're looking for a smarter way to make product decisions, Heap is here to help. But back to insights, where does this idea come from? At the last product con in London, if you remember back when we still had live conferences, my co-founder Ravi Parikh gave a presentation called Product Analytics is Useless. Yes, that's right. The founder of a product analytics company talked about how product analytics is useless. Of course, despite the provocative title, we don't really think that product analytics is useless. What we wanted to convey was that while product analytics are in fact enormously valuable, it takes a little bit of work to make those product analytics tools valuable. The problem as we see it is that most data companies out there like to pretend that simply having data is the same as making a better product. That we think is a big problem in the analytics world. Companies pitch data as if simply giving people the right dashboard will somehow produce an amazing product. As if all you have to do is just give your product team a string of numbers and poof, out pops a world changing product. We describe this problem with the phrase, the tool is not the action which it isn't. Having data is not the same thing as using that data to make better decisions. Having numbers in front of you is not the same as using those numbers to actually build things and ship things for your users. What's important isn't just data, it's how product teams ultimately use the data to build better products. And mainly it's going to be about how they build data into their practices and activities. So at Heap, we're busy developing this approach that we call the scientific method for product. We think it's a better way to use data to drive product decisions. And ultimately, we think that being scientific gives teams the best chance of making something delightful. Or if you want to be more formal, producing a product that converts and retains users at a high rate. So today, I want to expand on this idea a little bit. The idea that simply having a dashboard is not the goal of your analytics setup. And what we'll argue today, and what I want to claim today, is that the primary way that data produces amazing products is through providing insights. And what we believe at Heap is that insights is the key intermediary link between data on one side and awesome products on the other. Okay, so the idea that insights are important is probably not a novel idea to most people here. It's important to get insights, everybody understands that, that's obvious. But we think there's something to be gained by being a little bit more specific here. After all, if insights are what matter, then by honing in on what an insight is and thinking carefully about how we acquire them, we can work to structure our product development processes around getting more of them. So what is an insight? Well, dictionary.com defines an insight as an instance of apprehending the true nature of a thing. Okay, that's not that helpful, at least not for product teams. If we look at Webster, they call it the power or act of seeing into a situation. Okay, maybe a little bit better, but still pretty vague. So I'm going to offer a tentative definition we've been working on here. And note that this definition of insight is insight as it applies to product teams. And as we see it, an insight has two key characteristics. Number one, an insight changes the story you tell about your product. And number two, an insight leads you to action. An insight changes your story about your product, and an insight leads you to action. So first, let's talk about number one. An insight changes the story you tell about your product. As we see it, this is a crucial part of the picture. The basic is, idea is that you have a mental model, no matter how vague, about what your product is, what it does, who uses it, how they use it, so on and so forth. And of course, you should have a strong mental model about these things. If you're not thinking about the person you're making your product for, if you're not thinking about how they're using it, well, you, you've got some pretty fundamental work to do. In the case of Heap, for example, the story for us is that Heap is for people who want to know what users do in their product, but don't want to have to wait months to figure that out. 
So over time, your story should become more detailed, not only what jobs people use it for, but what things are easy for them, what things are hard, what things they wish were smoother, more powerful. Ideally, your story also gets more sophisticated about the people who use your product. If you have an e-commerce product, for instance, you might eventually see that people who come from paid ads tend to buy a certain item or that people who read reviews tend to convert more. If you have a SaaS product, your story might be that managers use your product differently than ICs do, or that marketing teams use it differently than finance teams do, or so on. So back to the original question, what is an insight? An insight is a piece of information that challenges your presumptions or suppositions about your product, and in turn changes the mental model about who your product is for and what those people do with it. It's a kind of cognitive dissonance that leads you to modify your understanding, or at least to refine your understanding. An insight may tell you what you thought was easy about your product actually is not easy, or that people use your product in a slightly different way than you imagined, or that a specific group of people acts differently in your product than you had thought. So that's the first piece of our definition. An insight changes your story about your product. Now that's great, but in our industry, a piece of knowledge isn't really meaningful. There's nothing to be done about it. And that's why we have the second part of this definition. An insight leads you to action. The point is that an insight is valuable not only if it changes your mental model, but if it leads you to change something about your product or about how you sell it or about how you evolve your company's product market fit. Let's take an example here. So one of our customers, Sir Latab, found that people who viewed the company's product pages tended to purchase more than people who did it. That was something that refined their mental model. The action they took as a result of that finding was to drive usage to their product pages and to make it more prominent within their overall website. This experiment in turn led them to increase purchase rates by 6%. And that's the insight, a piece of information that changed their story and led them to action. Okay, so that's what an insight is. If we go back a little bit, we said that insights are the crucial link between data and product then it seems like you'd want to maximize the number of insights that you get. And that's what we believe at least. A good analytics tool should maximize the amount of insights a product team acquires. The more and the deeper the insight a team receives, the better. So this leads to the second part of my tile. How do you get more of them? How do you get more insights? That's one of the big things we're working on at Heap. And again, lots of analytics and data companies pretend as if simply having data is the same as creating insights, and it's not. Numbers by themselves are not insights. The dashboards on your walls are not insights. At Heap, we believe that insights come from combining technology and process, and we're working on helping product teams build up both aspects of their stack. In what follows, I'll lay out a few of the things we're working on. These are the technologies, or the combinations of technologies and processes that we think can maximize the number of insights you have about your product. I'm going to lay out three of these. The first one here is this idea, make hypotheses, test with data. Of the three things I'm laying out in this talk, this is the most important one, because it combines both technological and procedural approaches. As I said earlier, one thing we're trying to develop at Heap is what we're calling the scientific method for product. And as we see it, being scientific means two things. It means adopting certain approaches to product, and it means using specific technologies that make those approaches viable. Insights, getting insights requires a combination of these things. So the general idea with this approach is that if you're looking to change your story about your product, then well, you want to be testing everything about it. And this is part of the standard scientific model. When scientists run experiments, the assumption is that the status quo is the null set, that what we already think is true is true. And their job as scientists is to make hypotheses that prove the status quo wrong. That should be your job as a product manager. If you want to get more insights, you need to be challenging your ideas. The way you do that is by making hypotheses. Let's say you run a SaaS site. To promote a new feature, you run a blog series describing what the feature is, how people should use it, what amazing benefits it will provide, so on and so forth. Now, of course, in writing this blog series, your hypothesis is that putting it out there will increase activation. So what do you do? 
Well, if you want to test the efficacy of your hypothesis, you measure whether people who read the blog series are more likely to adopt this feature. And if they are, great. Your hypotheses may be correct. And if they're not, then it's time to look at other methods of promotion and perhaps to save your blog writer time. That's just a small example, but the larger point here is that you should be throwing out plausible ideas that challenge your given thoughts and then use data to test the efficacy of those hypotheses. We love this approach. And in fact, at Heap, we sometimes say, make hypotheses, not decisions. The idea is that decisions seem more fixed, they're less intractable, whereas decisions are hard to walk back. Decisions are permanent, whereas hypotheses, well, they're just tests. They're just ideas you're trying out. Getting them wrong is totally fine. It's okay to test and reject your hypotheses. That's what you're supposed to do. So the more you can look at your assumptions about your product, who uses it, what they use it for, what they do while they're there, so on and so forth, the more you can look at these as hypotheses and the easier it will be to test for them. And as a result, you will get more insights. So make hypotheses and test with data. The second piece here, have the data at hand. So of course, the idea that you should be making hypotheses and testing with data is only possible if you actually have the data. Want to make 100 hypotheses? That's pretty easy. You can just write them down in a spreadsheet. Want to test them? Well, that depends on having data. Of course, as a product analytics company, we think having data is pretty essential. But the thing is, for most PMs, actually getting the data and then using it to test hypotheses is difficult and time consuming. This is partially why we built Heap. In most cases, getting data on how people use your product is difficult. First, you have to decide what you want to track. Then you have to cajole engineers into writing tracking code for you. Then you have to wait months for the data to come in. And then once you have the data, you need to know how to analyze it and structure it to get the information you want. It's unfortunately no small feat. At Heap, we believe that getting insights, i.e. getting the information that leads you to an action, should not be difficult. When we started Heap, we knew there had to be a better way to do all of this. And that's why we built our platform on auto capture, a technology that grabs user data immediately and automatically without the need for engineering resources. You'll always have the data you need and you can query it retroactively. Want to know if people who look at your blog are more likely to use a certain feature or purchase a certain item? Well, with Heap, you'll have the data there immediately ready to dig into. Why is this important for insights? Remember, an insight isn't just something that verifies what you already know. It's information that tells you something you did not already know. That's really the benefit of auto capture. It's not necessarily that you can more easily capture data about things you already do know about, though it's helpful for that too. The real advantage is having all of your data at hand easily so that you can learn about things you don't already know about. Here's an example. Let's take one of our customers, Lending Club. It's a large peer-to-peer -peer online lender. As you might imagine, the process of applying for and receiving a large loan is complex. And as you can imagine, Lending Club requires users to fill out dozens of form fields and provide a lot of information in order to apply for a loan. Naturally, there's a lot of drop-off in this process and Lending Club wanted to reduce it. As it happens, Alan D'Souza, the Director of Product Analytics at Lending Club, is a big believer in data. And as his team dug in, they realized that when people saw errors, those people tended to drop off. Okay, fair enough. Luckily, however, the team had lots of data around user behavior, and they noticed something interesting. After receiving an error, some people corrected and moved on, while others, when they received the error, strangely just dropped off entirely. Well, why was this? It turns out some people who received errors continued on as if they hadn't received an error. That is, those people kept trying to fill out the form without correcting the error. And sometimes they tried to do this same thing three or four times before dropping off. Strange. Well, the team at Lending Club hypothesized that maybe these people weren't noticing the errors. It's a reasonable hypothesis. Maybe the errors weren't being displayed prominently enough. And as a result, people were getting confused and frustrated. So what did the team do? Well, they made the errors more prominent. And guess what? Conversion rates increased significantly for one of the most critical funnels in their entire user experience. The insight here is that people who were receiving errors were continuing, continuing on as if they had it. Seeing that people drop off isn't a particularly compelling insight. Filling out a lot of forms is boring and that in itself is going to deter some people. 
Rather, the insight is that people who should be correcting errors were not correcting those errors. And that insight was what changed the story about the product and led to action. It wasn't just seeing drop off from, from one step to another. And that insight was only available because the team had that data at hand to verify and dig into that hypothesis. Number three here is this idea of constant evolution and constant iteration. Finally, this is a combination of both technology and process. Something we believe in deeply at Heap is that great products are built by a series of small improvements. There's always the story about the genius who wakes up with the perfect idea fully worked out, and it's a nice story, but we at Heap have never seen that actually happen in real life. Rather, great products as we've seen them emerge from a process of repetition, iteration, and small improvements. You keep chipping away and chipping away, and hopefully those small improvements add up to something big. Or you chip away and chip away, and one day you discover something huge that you never would have expected in the first place. What does this have to do with insights? Well, as we see it, the idea is that making lots of small changes is what allows you to have insights in the first place. You make hypotheses, you roll out small changes, and you see how those changes are adapted by the market. It's these kinds of small changes that open the door to major advancements. I'm sure everyone here is somewhat familiar with the story of how YouTube started. As most people might know, it started as a dating site. Steve Chen and his co-founders wanted to copy the popular site Hot or Not. As part of their own take on Hot or Not, they added an option for people to post videos on their site. And the insight here was that people started using the video part more and more on its own, even when they weren't trying to date other people. The insight there led to an action that changed the site, led to a series of iterations that ultimately created the behemoth that we all know today. As another example, let's take a look at Airbnb, which is famous for experimenting with just about everything. They test every single part of their site, their algorithms, all of their development is based on hypotheses and they leave practically no stone unturned. Lots of these experiments produce no meaningful results whatsoever. And that's okay. The ones that work tend to increase revenue, engagement, and all of the key metrics that they care about. One of the quotes from their data scientists is this idea that we use controlled experiments to learn and make decisions at every step of product development from design to algorithms. They are equally important in shaping the user experience. So in summary, these three ideas, make hypotheses, test with data, have the data at hand, and constant evolution, constant iteration. Those three things are the pillars of the approaches we take to help teams get more insights. And if you're interested in talking more about insights, I encourage you to reach out. Thank you all so much, and I hope you all have a great day.